in the name of the one holy and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Where do we go to find God? Where do we go where we know God's presence is there? Various of the world religions have sacred places, places where there was a special event that happened, a place where there is a special connection with God, where God may be most particularly present. All of the Holy Land is such a place for Christianity in some sense and Judaism and Islam, and perhaps even more for Islam and Judaism than for Christianity. Some specific places in Jerusalem are places of contention because of how important they are to different world religions. The site of the Old Temple in Jerusalem, also the site of the Dome of the Rock, the mosque in Jerusalem. So where do we go when we know it's a special place and that God is there? The Holy Spirit in Christianity is not limited to a particular place or a particular space. And that is a bit of a difference then in terms of how we understand the presence of God. Jesus, in these gospel stories that we hear heard one of today, where he is baptized by John, is anointed with the Holy Spirit in the Jordan River. Now, we may be experiencing a little bit of sort of even maybe kind of a panic of how did we get here already? Last week we were hearing about Jesus' birth and the wise men coming, and now all of a sudden today he's an adult and being baptized by John the Baptist. Boy, that was awfully quick. Kind of goes against all the theories about the importance of childhood and adolescence and all those developmental stages. We don't know anything about what happened to Jesus really in that time. One reason we don't know much is because the, there are two Gospels that actually start at Jesus' baptism. Matthew has the story of Jesus' birth and the wise men. Luke has the story of Jesus' birth with the angels and the shepherds. But Mark and John really begin with Jesus' baptism. And this is the point that all four Gospels have. To note the beginning of what is referred to as Jesus' public ministry. And he was baptized in the Jordan River by John. And what's partly unique about this is that John is baptizing people in a baptism of repentance. People are coming to John and confessing their sins, and he is baptizing them to signify their being cleansed from their sins. And in some accounts of the story, Jesus appears, and John says, you should not be baptized. If anything, you should be baptizing me. But not you should not be. This is a baptism of repentance. What should you be repenting about? And Jesus says, nevertheless, you will baptize me. And so he is baptized. And in some variation, again, depending on the gospel, there is a voice which says, Behold my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And some accounts only Jesus hears the voice, and other accounts everyone there hears the voice. So is what, what, is, what is important here where it's happening? Is it the Jordan River? that makes this the special thing that it is, or is it something else? One year, many years ago, I was doing a baptism, actually, on this day, which is one of the days we have baptisms, and the family appeared with uh, a vial of water from the Jordan River. And I've actually had this happen several different times over 30 years of ordained ministry, where someone has some water from the Jordan River. And one time, the people said, now we know this child is going to be really baptized. That is what is re 
referred to as a teaching moment. Where I had to say as gently and pastorally as possible, actually, this child will be no more baptized than anybody else who is baptized. It's not about the water. It's not about the Jordan River. Now, there are rivers in some traditions where we know the water is what makes the difference, but that's not Christianity. It's historically significant, but it's not in any way more sacred. Because what's important is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can be and is present anywhere. So sacred space is a place, a way for us to remember not that God is special and only in a certain place, but to remind us of God's presence everywhere. And so Jesus is baptized, and he begins his public ministry. Now part of what is also important for us to be mindful of is that that Holy Spirit that anointed Jesus, that made him the Christ, which means anointed one, is the same Holy Spirit that comes upon us when we are baptized. There is no difference. What happens with Jesus is that he is baptized to be the Christ, the anointed one. And then he perfectly fulfills who he is. So much so that he and the Father are one. That God is truly enfleshed in Jesus. But could Jesus have shaken that off? Could he have said, eh, don't know about this Christ part, I think I'll just be Jesus. Do I really have to do all these things? Do I have to go around teaching and healing people and calling these strange guys to follow around with me? Do I have to die on the cross? He could have changed his mind. He could have said no. And he would have ceased being the Christ. Did he have the will to, the, did he have the option of doing that? I believe so. Jesus had free will like the rest of us. But he didn't do that. He fulfilled his Christhood. Likewise, you and I are also Christ's. Do you know that? That's why one of the words for baptism is christening, which actually should be pronounced christening. So that's what the word means. We are anointed with the Holy Spirit. And we also have the option of saying no. What makes us different from Jesus is that so far every human being in the history of Christianity has at some time said no. At some time has failed to fulfill their baptismal promises. Has some time failed to be the Christ they are called to be, that we are called to be. What makes Jesus unique is not where he was baptized, it's not even that he's baptized, it's not that he was baptized by John, it's not what happens when he's baptized, because all of those things are not what's important, except that the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and then he fulfilled what he was called to do. And we don't, not completely, not fully, not all the time. That's what sets him apart. But we are anointed. And God does something in his baptism of Jesus that he also did with you and me, which is really remarkable if we pay attention to it. God says, you are my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. God doesn't wait until Jesus has gone around teaching and preaching for three years and healing people and, and feeding thousands of people and dying on the cross and rising from the dead. God doesn't wait for all that to happen before he says, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God says at the very beginning, I am pleased with you. Jesus 
hasn't even hardly begun to think that. God is pleased with you. And that's how God is with you and me. God is pleased because we are God's children. God loves us because we're God's children. Not because we're good, not because we've done everything we said we're going to do, not because we've earned it, just because. Because that's how God loves us. And so fulfilling our baptismal vows is not about sort of approaching heaven and saying, here's my baptismal certificate, I get in, right? Or I did, you know, I got like 90% right, so I get in, right? Or how, you know, is there a failing level where I don't get in? It's not about that at all. Fulfilling our baptismal vows is not about trying to get into heaven. It is about trying to get heaven in here. It's about trying to get heaven on earth. It's about fulfilling what we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so fulfilling our baptismal vows is an act of being who we are, or not. Are we going to be who we're supposed to be? Are we going to be the true selves that we are as baptized children of God, or are we going to try to be something else, in which case we will be dead? Because we will not be who we're supposed to be. We will be a shell. We will be an imposter. And our true selves will not be alive. Now, we don't do it. And so God, over and over again, forgives. God, over and over again, renews. God, over and over again, says, okay, get up. Let me wash your face. With you, I am well. And so let us celebrate this epiphany event where God is made manifest and Christ at his baptism and then from there on. Let us also celebrate the epiphany event that is you and me. God becoming Christ in us. And as we do so, let us stand and renew our baptismal vows.